uh, to IRRES. I'm thrilled to see so many people here, including some familiar faces. Um, I wanted to give this talk today that talks a little bit about my own research, but it also talks about law in a way that I hope is helpful for those of you who think what you do might be partially law. And so this conversation reflects not only on how lawyers see law, but it reflects a little on some of the critical questions when other people tell me, oh, there are these tremendous legal aspects to my work. Um, and so I want to at least have time for us to start a conversation about what we might think law is um, in the various disciplines and the various geographic places um, that we work. And I come to this question because I've had my own sort of struggles with what we, I might conceptualize as law. Um, as Gunilla mentioned, before I came to be an academic at UBC, I worked for uh, a good number of years in private practice, so I was a lawyer. And I worked uh, for Oxfam in a legal capacity, and I worked for the United Nations in a legal capacity. So I had a sort of sense of what I thought environmental law was. And then I arrived at a teaching position as a first year assistant professor in a law school, and I was confronted with a real clash in terms of how law was presented um, in the academic milieu. And environmental law, if any of you have decided that there's legal aspects to your work and you've migrated over to the world of legal textbooks, you'll discover that environmental law is very dull to read. Um, law evokes in environmental law textbooks this sort of knee-jerk reaction of uh, statutes, of courts, of a certain image, um, let's see how my slide advancing goes. Um, do we, sorry, which is that? Okay. Um, about a sort of images that I've represented here. So first of all, we have law as, as text. We have law as coming with a gavel out of the judiciary, case law. And we certainly have law with glasses because it's something nerdy that people who sit in libraries and courtrooms and law offices do. Um, there's no action figure here, you know, out in the real world changing things. And so it's this picture of law that I wanted to engage with in my talk today, because often when we capture law in this narrow way, we miss a lot of the interesting work that I know many of you are doing and the legal ramifications or legal consequences of that work. So what I want to do here is to talk about a wider vision of law than being statutes, case law, and the stuff of what litigators do. And this very much presents what I would call a transactional view of law. And it's really at that transactional point um, that I'm interested in. So over the last 10 years, my research agenda has very much attempted to capture an unorthodox view of law that is sort of law in the trenches. Law that, act, that is law in action where people are using law in their everyday lives to improve environmental protection. And there's a couple immediate consequences of this work. Um, the first is that you have to look beyond the state. And this may be something that um, people working in other disciplines do as a matter of everyday life. You're not fixated on the state when you are asked, um, well, what difference can environmental protection make? You don't think, well, it depends what the government's willing to do. Uh, we have these fixtures in law. We have these sort of fixations and problems. And so in law, when we say environmental law is failing, we mean the government is failing. The government is either not enacting strong enough laws, or it's not implementing those laws, or it's not enforcing those laws. And so we, quite, we lead quite comfortable lives because we can say, well, if the law is failing, that's the government's responsibility. We have a bad government. You know, what help you know, can there be? And we really nicely don't point the blame ever on ourselves because we are quite legally irrelevant. We are just people. And communities are just communities. Corporations you know, are not entities that make law. And so in this state-centric world, we can be quite smug and quite comfortable, and we can always blame environmental laws failures on someone else. 
So the sort of research I do engages with a very different picture because it looks, well, where is that view challenged in the world? And it is challenged everywhere. You don't have to look very far to see ways that individuals, corporations, communities, indigenous groups are using law in a transactional way to uh, enforce environmental protection of the issues that matter to them. So a couple of examples where we can see this acutely. Um, in the Aboriginal context in Canada, impact benefit agreements have been a way in which indigenous communities have negotiated with other stakeholders um, to ensure environmental protection and to also ensure participation. And this has happened um, outside the world of statutes and regulations. These agreements really preceded any legal requirements that those negotiations happen. But it happened in a way that was inherently relevant to the legal because the form of these agreements has been binding contracts. And so the fact that contracts are at the heart of this vision of using law um, means that they might just be significant for lawyers. But again, we come across this hurdle in legal theory that environmental law doesn't look to contract. We divide law between public law and private law. Private law are things like contracts and torts, individual legal actions. And public law is um, the field where we look at the government, we look at environmental rights, we look at the charter, we say, well, damn, why don't we have a constitution that recognizes a right to an environment, healthy environment? So we have these quite different pictures right from the start of, well, what sort of law matters if we're into environmental protection? And for law students who come from varied interdisciplinary backgrounds with this passion to use law to make a difference, um, they inevitably say, I'm going to be an environmental litigator. I'm going to get that law and I'm going to go through the courts and I'm going to have groundbreaking decisions and um, I'm also going to pressure for legal change. We're going to get strong statutes. And so there's always this blinding appeal that somehow being a litigator is a little bit sexier than negotiating agreements on the ground. Um, I know there's a couple people in the room who are my age, so they'll probably have also been subjected to the vision of Ally McBeal and other superstar litigators that populated television some decades ago. Um, I'm sure there's equivalents today, but the idea is that the action is in the courts. Um, and for those of you who study regulation more deeply, the action is in getting something tabled through Parliament after three readings and two sit goes through the Senate actually getting something enacted. If we look historically at environmental law in Canada and the United States, we'll see that that vision really worked in the late 1960s and early 1970s. That's when our environmental laws were made. Um, we don't have that sort of lawmaking happening right now. We don't have it coming through the courts and we don't have it coming through Parliament. We do have some gutting of the environmental laws we put into place in the early 70s. But we're not in an era where the action um, is in the courts and in Parliament. Um, so back to where we do see action. I highlighted the Aboriginal context of impact and benefit agreements. Other places where we've seen um, environmental contracts take on a really important role is in trying to implement some of the aspects um, of payment for ecosystem services. So when there has been an attempt to um, legalize contracting approaches, um, we see the law uh, step in. And a couple of, a few examples of that sort of work I include here to highlight perhaps some of the actual agreements that your work might touch on. The literature that looks at these sort of place-based agreements is a literature that is written by marine biologists. It's a literature that's written by economists, social scientists. Um, but it is not a literature that's been written by lawyers. And so law has been largely uninterested in the contractual basis for conservation. Um, in my work, I've done a lot of research interviews of the people who are negotiating these agreements internationally. And what's curious about 
um, those negotiations is that they happen from an idea that you can negotiate the guts of agreement, and these are, of course, the long nights, you know, the hard battled um, fights over wording, and then the negotiators go home and the lawyers come up and paper up the deal. And so there's a very um, instrumentalist view of law here, that law is nothing more significant than papering up the deal after all the important terms have already been agreed. So one of the questions for me in looking at this body of work has been, well, what difference might a legal lens make? What can law add to this picture that's largely been constructed um, by non-lawyers? One of the immediate things I think a legal voice can add is an attention to text. I find that when people study uh, agreements from outside law, um, it's curious, but they rarely read the agreements themselves. So people will tell me, well, have you looked at supply chain contracts? Because supply chain contracts do this and do that, and they capture this. And people will tell me that, oh, well, in these other bodies of literature, you'll see that um, access and benefit agreements do this. And so I'll, I'll be curious and say, well, well, how does that work in terms of you know, some issue? And it immediately becomes apparent that people rarely actually read the agreements themselves. So I think one of the insights that law can add is that when you're talking about contracts or agreements or negotiations or deals as governance, there's a lot of value in reading what's actually in the text. And this textual analysis can open up a whole host of other questions um, that you might not originally have thought of. Another way in which law is significant to this sort of view is that highlights that the contract is not just a moment in time. It's not limited to something that two parties have argued, but rather it's a product of a long history, and it will be something that is likely renegotiated um, over time. So that when you approach something um, that seems to capture agreement between parties, view it as a single moment in time <coughs> and as something that will likely uh, change as it is interpreted. I think one way we see this is through dispute resolution clauses. Um, we can approach agreements between communities and uh, indigenous groups to, for example, allow for water monitoring of a mine site. Um, but we realize that that is just often what is anticipated before the issues actually arise. And it's that long history that comes when you realize, well, our agreement didn't actually capture anything that we really care about now, this mine is operational and you get a much richer picture of how law isn't about a single agreement. It also has a lot to say about the dispute resolution mechanism that might come um, from an agreement. The last point I wanna highlight about why a legal lens might make a difference is to highlight that environmental law never acts in isolation. It might be the bit of law that interests you, but why things happen are rarely the product of one piece of law why companies might act in a certain way at a project if you're trying to understand their environmental behavior might be shaped as much by tax law as it is by environmental law. It might be just as much about rules of jurisdiction and where a corporation has been set up as it is about what you think really matters. So law is deeply embedded, it's deeply relational, and laws speak to each other. And part of the value of a legal lens is that we can understand that law isn't something that just acts in isolation. Why I highlight this point is because I often see in graduate work this temptation to have a chapter on law and policy. And in this way to say that law and policy can be something that can be isolated and put as you know 4.2 in your work without really realizing the way in which it bleeds into every other issue. So this is a sort of reaction against uh, the temptation to make law clean and neat when in reality um, it's so messy. So my work as I've explored um, environmental textbooks has gone on to ask, well, why don't we talk about contractual agreements, deals, 
negotiated arrangements when we do attempt to capture what environmental law is. And the first reason for this, I've highlighted already, is this fixation on the state. So what happens when legal scholars try to move beyond the state and say that an agreement signed between a polluter and a government entity or between um, a community and an environmental NGO in the DC Beltway that's going to pay them uh, to refrain from cutting down a particular forest. What happens when we enlarge law in such a way as we say those actors also matter? What we've seen in the sort of reaction from legal scholars is for them to say, well, go talk to the political scientists. Um, that sort of stuff is private environmental governance. It's not what law is about. And so I think that conversation is interesting because it starts af us asking, well, what's different about all that stuff and law? What is it about law that makes us say law is different and special and um, not as cheap and cheery as the stuff that political scientists get to deal with? So one of the points, the starting points, is this sense of authority. It's only the state that has authority. And these other sort of agreements don't come from that place of state authority. Another aspect is the idea that unless you have the government in the room, the state, you can't be representing the public interest. Only uh, other parties will be putting forward special interests, whether they be NGOs or communities, and that we still have this confidence um, even as people will say that the government's not doing its job, that what makes law different is that it has the imprimatur of the state. So this still is a field where legal scholars are, are grappling. We don't know what a theory of law that is somewhat uh, decentralized from the state looks like, but I think that the significant bodies of agreements that are emerging make us this confront this question. And one of the significant things about confronting the question of what does law look like when it's decentered from the state is that we start appreciating the really disaggregated nature of the state. That by um, saying government is X, we really do a disservice um, to government because we're not recognizing the multiple hats and the contradictions between the actors we traditionally lump together as the state. So I think we end up with a richer account, certainly of non-state actors, but we end up um, with a richer uh, sense of the state as well. Another observation that comes from this is that we tend to capture environmental law uh, in a way that um, encourages a sort of cut and paste approach to life when people are thinking about instruments that can solve the problems of the world, and this probably spans a number of topics in which you approach, at some point in the conversation is there, well, isn't there some innovative legal tool that I can bring to bear on this problem? And I think this draws on the sense that many of you in this room are here because at some sense you think your work can make a real difference in the world. You are here because you want to find that tool, that instrument, that approach, that novelty, that insight, that new theory that can really make a difference um, in protecting environments in a way that others haven't quite discovered before. Maybe I spent too much time reading the um, bio of the Nobel laureates this morning in the Globe and Mail. But there is often this sense um, in academic circles that we can make a difference. And so when we look to environmental law, we do with this sort of blinding light that says, somewhere here is that tool, that missing piece. And if I find that this agreement that was negotiated in northern Canada and is actually having these tremendous outcomes, um, and I can explore it in my PhD, and then I can ship it around the world and solve these problems, I think this hope underlies a lot of the work that we do, that somewhere there is a tool that's worth excavating, it's worth exploring, and ultimately, it's worth transplanting. And I think scholars yearn for policy relevance. But there's a number of consequences of this. If we think about the results of that vision, 
for how we capture law. And the first is that we always want to find the innovative, the successful, the best example, that thing that worked somewhere. And what this does is bias our case study selection. Rather than me saying, I'm going to give you, you know, a sort of ho-hum picture of some agreements that have worked, some that haven't worked, and many that we just don't really know about because there's nothing interesting to emerge from them. We don't select that middle ground. We highlight the spectacular successes, the agreements that protected marine areas that we thought never would be able to be protected. And we choose the spectacular loser case examples, how every part of this experiment failed. And we ignore the middle ground. And I think we also tend to overstate the transferability of the examples we find. We tend to um, emphasize the originality, the novelty, the innovation. And I think all I'm doing is, rather than giving you the me to we, you can change the world talk here, um, which you know maybe someone else will get another day, you get the this is the place where it's also helpful to have critical reflection on the work you do, why you do it, what you're choosing, and in those accounts, what we obscure. And it often happens after the first draft. We've sort of done our interviews, we've decided what we want to capture, we have this full account, and then we want to have something pithy and useful or um, really impactful come out of it, and our work gets to sort of you know, boil on the stove and get condensed to a party piece or something you think might be able to you know, get you past a five minute conversation of what is the issue you're working on right now. And so I'm alert in that condensing phase uh, to the fact that when we do that with law, and we do it with law all the time, we come up with a really partial account of law and we don't capture all the nuances of what law might look like um, when we move beyond the exciting examples of how law can transform the world or where communities have been able to use law uh, to get places they never thought they'd get before. There's also an epistemological piece to even talking about this private side of the law this side of the law that's attentive to uh, what actors other than states are doing, this part of the law that looks to contracts. And when I talk to legal audiences about my work, I get a lot of hatred. <laughs> it's not a popular topic with legal scholars to talk about private environmental governance because these private initiatives seem, for many scholars, to be giving a justification for the contracting out of government. They seem to allow a vision that says, that's okay, we'll let governments off the hook because private actors are doing so many interesting things. And so there's a real political piece um, that becomes part of the conversation and because you're just noting that these agreements exist, you somehow get caught up at, uh, in this work as not just the person who's describing these contractual approaches to environmental law, but necessarily as their advocate. And so what I wanted to capture in stressing the question of, well, what do we think law is and what do we look <coughs> to law for, is the fact that this is an inherently political exercise. And it reflects certain epistemological views of what law is. So for some, law is and always will be a strong state. For others, Law's job is to facilitate market transactions. And so when we see law this way, we say, well, the really important bits of law, for, for example, allowing there to be carbon markets that work across the world, is that law protects individual property rights. Property rights in, for example, forest carbon have to be recognized as a legal matter before you can even have a workable trading system. And the second function of law is to respect sanctity of contract. To allow people who make deals, absent oppression, to have those deals enforced. And so I think when you 
step back and say, well, what am I expecting from law? What am I looking to law for? Some of those questions will deeply depend on that vision that you have of what it is law's job to do. And I think increasingly when law's job is seen as bolstering up uh, an economic view of um, conservation through market transactions, we get the sort of appeal to law that says, law's job's very narrow. It's to make sure the market works neatly. It's to protect people through dispute resolution mechanisms who have had uh, expectations as investors. And so there are real clashes of worldviews that come into, par into play here because that is not the view that others certainly have for law. The last point I want to make before we have some time um, to discuss some of the ideas uh, invoked here is the idea that principles of law don't often travel well across different jurisdictions. But we often assume they do. Because if we come across a legal innovation in the Philippines um, where uh, communities have been paid not to fish to allow the creation of a marine protected area, and the mechanism that achieved this was a particular legal clause, the temptation is, well, let's take that and ship it around. And we have these norm entrepreneurs ready to go, particularly transnational environmental organizations that do that work of saying, this worked well for us in the Philippines, so let's try it uh, in Kiribati and in West Africa and everywhere else where this idea might um, have growth. And so this vision of the law is something that can just be cut and pasted as something that is mobile, that's something that can just be transplanted in new contexts, is something that we often see now reproduced in uh, environmental literatures that are looking for solutions agendas. But it's often done in a way that does not recognize the complexity of legal transplantation of different jurisdictions, of the fact that when I say something is a contract in Canada, that it looks very different if I say something as a contract in Bhutan. And that is because our basic ideas of law are not the same across different cultures. But as lawyers and as uh, people eager to propose environmental solutions, we often act as they do. So in suggesting that we need a sort of grounded, nuanced, messy, self-reflective, um, very careful view of law. I just want to highlight that when you talk about law, and we could have a whole other discussion about law and policy, because that phrase tends to be used a lot as well, that law and the choice of how you're visioning law is not an apolitical choice. It's deeply significant, but that as a starting point, it's useful to have the conversation and to think, well, just maybe law could be much wider and much more promising um, than you initially may, may think it may be. So I'm going to finish my formal remarks there because I'm uh, excited to uh, hear about people's work and the legal aspects of it and um, to advance this conversation through your questions. I'd say probably the contract, because you have a few chances at, at change. So for contracts, you're looking immediately. The, people always assume that the courts are going to be the guardians of ethics in contract law. But actually, the way most contracts are changed is through re renegotiation. So if you and I agree to an oppressive contract, my first attempt will be to go to you and say, look, this is problematic. 
we thought at the beginning that this was going to work. It's not going to work for these reasons. Let's try to renegotiate. Failing that, you have access to a court and a whole system of appeal. I think the public policy realm is harder to crack, and maybe this is a sort of um, reflection on how, how hard it is right now to get change on environmental issues in Canada. Um, but the idea of lobbying your MP, then having your MP maybe represent the issue, I think it's, um, I think the courts are more immediate, and even before that, the, the individual conversation is often where change comes. Sure. Yeah, so I've been involved in many of these agreements. I started off as a researcher saying, I want to understand these agreements for my research, and then what happens when you're a lawyer in a remote community asking about an agreement is they say, well, actually, we have a problem. So can you be our pro bono legal counsel and represent us? So I've ended up moving very quickly to a position where I've been giving legal advice on these agreements, which involves that sort of layer of tax. So an agreement um, in uh, Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories was negotiated when the very first diamond mine was discovered in Canada, called the Acadi Agreement. And the agreement set up a um, independent environmental monitoring agency. And this was a real novelty in Canada at the time. It's since been replicated. But the Independent Environmental Monitoring Agency's job was to make, actually to act as a watchdog on the government and on the company. And the reason it was created is because the Aboriginal community said, we have no confidence in either the company or the government. We think they will all um, make all these promises at the environmental impact assessment stage and then keep none of them. So we need an independent watchdog that's going to um, hold them to account. So uh, this was created. It was celebrated you know, globally. NGOs ship this example around the world, try to get indigenous communities in Peru and Suriname to copycat and use this exact environmental agreement for the, their communities. But then there was a fundamental problem that I only realized when I closely read the text, and that is that the dispute resolution mechanism meant that only parties to the agreement could call for dispute resolution. So the parties to the agreement were the company, the government, and the Aboriginal groups. What happened is no one funded the monitoring agency. And so the monitoring agency said, you know, shit, we can't do our job. <laughs> and so they called for dispute resolution. But only by reading the terms of the contact do you realize that there's contractual privity among the parties and the Independent Environmental Monitoring Agency wasn't a party. So because of the way the agreement was constructed, they had no ability to make the parties do anything. And it was convenient that way for the parties because they didn't ever want to pay. So when you read the text, you get those sort of nuances um, that aren't apparent when you like, I read the glossy literature and thought, oh my god, this is transformational, this is happening in Canada, I'm so proud, what a great novelty. And then by looking at the text, I could appreciate that this isn't going to work. Another example that might speak more to uh, to convince you to change your ways. Yeah. Because the dispute resolution mechanism involved the parties to split the costs of dispute resolution. 
cost sharing and less costs were awarded as a result of um, what the finding was. But they didn't want to put money on the line. Or they wrote it based on what their client asked them to say. The independent environmental monitoring agency wasn't a party, so it wouldn't have had a lawyer. Right. Yeah, and I think what happened there is that there, the, the issue here came out of government's inability to um, capture through the environmental assessment process ways to respect what the First Nations were asking for. So they asked for the gov federal government to pay the cost of their lawyer. So in some ways, you know, it is shaped by how much money there is to pay. Um, this was also the first of its kind. So in that way, you're not going to... In the next agreement that it followed in the second diamond mine, the Diavik mine, that language was changed and the um, monitoring body was a party, right? So, there, so what, there was some learning. My second example for Kai is <coughs> an example that comes from um, the world of forest carbon. And so there's a legal group called the Katoomba Group that um, holds a sort of market niche in advising communities in the global south on how to transact around global car forest carbon in an age of red, or red plus, or red plus plus. And so they developed these mock contracts. And again, the literature I read said, you know, they're doing this tremendous work. They're bringing in um, law professors and law students from Duke, and they're coming up with these um, agreements for communities in the global south to protect forest carbon that put these communities on a fairer footing with the companies, the investors, the um, uh, other third parties they're negotiating with. So similarly, you know, it's like that, you know, big heart story. You feel warm, you're glad people are doing this work. And then I read the contract. And the contract was based on, I think, what law students in Duke would think is relevant. So the dispute resolution language was all around Delaware law. And so it instigated this impression that when you think about law, you think about Delaware, you think about the US. And I'm sure if you'd read that contract, even as a non-lawyer, those things would jump out at you. Is why, if you're giving this model contract to a community in the South Pacific, does the dispute resolution language talk about Delaware? And why does it talk about US law as the relevant jurisdiction? So I'll keep doing the sales job to you, but <laughs> I think there are things, um, and often it's interesting if non-lawyers actually read contracts. Like I think most of you, the contracts you may read are, you know, the back of your ski pass, or when you're, you know, going on some terrific whitewater uh, kayaking holiday when you have to fill in the long limitation of liability, and so that might be the sense of uh, legal language or contractual language. But it actually says a lot, if you read the terms of a contract, about what people think is important enough to highlight um, um, for the law. Yeah? Yeah, so at a, at a very simplistic level, you have to have an offer, you have to have acceptance of that offer, and you have to have some sort of consideration. In other words, there has to be some, some legal significance that you're giving up something in return for what you're bargaining. So that would be the sort of simple common law sense of whether a contract or not is formed. What I found really interesting in the sort of work I've done um, say around marine conservation agreements, is that you will have a situation where one side says, we absolutely have a binding contract. The reason why we're using contract in this form rather than a memo of understanding is because we want to have something bulletproof. We want to have the law behind it. And then you'll talk to the other party and they'll say, oh, well, there was no legal significance to the thing we signed. We just wanted to both capture what we were thinking on a piece of paper. And so that really gets back to this point about legal culture, is that people 
have different senses of what a contract looks like. And so some of the literature um, captures these agreements as quasi-legal and says that, well, if it's not really a contract that looks like a commercial contract and smells like a commercial contract, and then maybe it's not really a contract. Um, and so th there, isn't, there isn't a sense when you talk about these agreements um, that they are necessarily black and white contracts or not. So you have all these agreements in British Columbia, like the Great Bear Rainforest Agreement or the Boreal Forest Agreement, where you have groups of forestry companies and groups of NGOs agree to various clauses, various aspirations, and then they sit down and have a signing ceremony you know, to encapsulate that in a binding agreement. And you could easily say they're non-legal. Um, you know, the significance of being able to take the Boreal Forest Agreement to court and say, you know, well, these forestry companies committed to work towards making this a protected area. So there, there's different sort of sorts of contracts and there's also different legal significance, but sort of at that knee-jerk level, that's a sort of sniff test for, for what you, whether you might have a contract or not. I use the word quite loosely here, but I think using the word contract's important because it signifies um, that we're not just dealing with public policy or memos or thoughts or um, agreements over a glass of wine. We're actually doing, dealing with something that has potential legal significance. Yeah, I think it's a great question because what we see right now in a lot of those different conservation agreements um, that I highlighted, if I can go back for a minute, is that um, these are being negotiated in transnational settings and they're not traditionally subject to domestic law. But international environmental law deals with relationships between states. The dispute resolution mechanisms largely are state-centric. The International Court of Justice, you have to be a state to bring an action. So the question is, well, if you violate a transnational legal agreement related to marine protection issues or there's oppression and the contract should be void, um, where do you go? And we saw this uh, in early days with some early negotiations around Red Plus agreements and um, protecting the idea of creating a market for forest carbon because there were all these scandals, these carbon cowboys traveling through the world, negotiating these suspect deals um, where they were going to go and um, take responsibility for a, cumin, uh, a community's carbon emissions and market that and you know make someone rich, right? And there was a lot of uh, scummy dealing, really around those agreements. They were coerced, they were unfair, they were biased, they were, they were problematic, this sort of first generation with um, people thinking, oh, here's, here's a way to make a quick buck. But they're not um, subject to Delaware law, right? There isn't that, okay, I can walk into court and get a remedy. So what we've seen is that a lot of these agreements that are transnational, that move across more than one border, enforcement happens through other means. And largely, it's happened through NGOs outing unscrupulous dealers. So that where contracts have been um, unfair, where they've been oppressive to communities, where, for example, indigenous communities have been asked to sign agreements that say, we will never make traditional use of our forests because we want to protect our forests um, for the carbon value. Um, those agreements have been highlighted by various NGOs doing sort of forensic work as unconscionable, and they have been asked to rescind the agreements and pull out, and some of those companies doing that sort of work just can't, can't operate. But it hasn't been because there have been courts or arbitration panels um, finding that what they're doing 
uh, is illegal or immoral. Yeah, Michelle? No, they're off, they, they exist, but international commercial arbitration is notoriously expensive and notoriously complex. And it requires, you know, using a lawyer from a certain bar of international commercial arbitrators. So it makes sense only when big money is at stake. And so when a community, it's usually not even the communities that are complaining. It's the NGO community that's saying what's happened in this agreement that we're not party to and we're just looking at from the outside is unfair. So it's not even the party itself. So we do have international commercial arbitration as the dispute resolution mechanism of choice in most of these agreements, but we don't have a record of arbitrations actually happening um, where we could say this is how arbitrators are interpreting this. I think as carbon markets become more complex, and um, right now a lot of NGOs have sort of private sector arms that are doing some of that transacting work. Um, I, th I think as the, the market sort of for those mechanisms deepens, as the pools of legal talent who are working on those issues deepens, we will see international commercial arbitration being used. But the deals sort of have to be of the magnitude that it makes sense spending a few million on dispute resolution. I think it's avoiding the idea that you can just have a better contractual form that you take into different places and make work. I think it is really listening to the parties and what they want. Um, I think where agreements have worked well, it's because there's been seven years of a community wanting to negotiate the issue to make sure something's done right. Um, they work well where there's lots of money. So the uh, Acadie example, there were millions on the table to make this agreement work because there were millions of dollars that were going to be able to be seen as you know extra profit to play with from a, a, a lucrative mine, right? It's harder to make these work in settings where there's no cash, a lack of goodwill, a lack of the long term. As you can just see the topics we're dealing with, it's a long, long-term process of negotiating, a long-term um, process of implementation. And um, sure, part of it is having a good lawyer, uh, but part of it is also saying, well, what, what's really at stake here? What are we trying to do rather than what can we see what's worked for another community uh, that we can try to copy for us? There's a question in the back. Right. Yeah, so Conservation International is a good example of an organization that now has um, a separate arm that's working on conservation agreements. Uh, and it's looking at going to different communities and negotiating these agreements. But what's been interesting, because I've done a lot of work with them on them, is that if you create your, your map of the planet and you start dotting in where these agreements are, they become very, very concentrated. And you say, oh, well, why are, why are you only interested in protecting these 
ecosystems using conservation agreements. Is there something about private contracts that only works? And so I you know, would look at these maps and you know, try to figure it out and think, is it something about receptiveness to certain legal traditions in the common law? And they're like, no, it's donor driven. <laughs> right? And so then when you, you understand that these things are only going to happen when there's someone willing to put some cash on the line to protect certain um, ecosystems, you see, oh, well, maybe there's more comfort with that other vision of law that says that things are going to happen you know, across countries um, and you're not reliant on this being a, a donor-driven um, initiative, which is what, what, what actually happens when it's, it's an NGO. Uh, sponsored piece. We're good. Stopped on time. You just said 120. <laughs> Thank you.